we're ready to start, ready to rock and roll. Just to give you a little overview of what we have been uh, studying until now. So you can all remember what, what's going on, the roadmap of our class. And it's it's been, uh, we tried to organize it. The first class we learned, what is Mishnah and Talmud all about? About the oral tradition and, it's, and, and everything that comes with it. We spoke about the five pillars of the mission of the Talmud. That was the first class. Second class, we discussed the uh, roadmap from Mount Sinai all the way down to today, how the Torah developed in the form of uh, the Tanakh, then the Mishnah, then the Gemara, then the, then the, uh, then the, um, um, the different uh, poskim, the different decisors, all the way up to the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. In the third class, we, we took a blot Gemara, page of the Gemara, and we tried to understand how to navigate a page of the Talmud. So you should have a fairly good idea by now Hello. of what, uh, welcome, welcome, of what a page of the Gemara is about, the page of the Talmud. And, um, and uh, last week, we studied the first blot, the first page of Masechet Brachot, the very first page of of the Talmud. Okay, so I'm going to give you here. Uh, I'm just going to give out some pages here. There we go. Okay. Um, one page. Another page. Um, uh, this is. These are. These are. These. these. The second page for you. Okay. And uh, so who's coming over there, Edna? So I'll, like, I'll leave the page for Ed over here. It's the two pages from your head. Okay. Um, last week we did Mesechet Brachot. We did the first page of Brachot. And we saw how the Mishnah is structured, Talmud, the Gemara, which comes afterwards, which we said is a super commentary on the Mishnah. And then we had the commentaries, uh, the, the medieval commentaries, Rashi on the one side and Toysfus on the other side. And we saw how how a page of the Talmud sort of unfolds, right? That's what we looked at last week. If you guys can hear me online, please give me a thumbs up just to make sure. So, hell, hi again. So, um, that's that's what we uh, that's what we studied um, last week. This week, so last week we studied a page of a halacha, halachic gemara. Um, what we call uh, the, the, uh, the halachic part of the Gemara. And this week, we're going to look at a piece of Agadita, Agada. Agada is more uh, midrashic, more stories. And so the Gemara, we said, has two parts. Gemara has in it some parts of the Gemara, which is more halachic debates, understanding the oral tradition of the Jewish people. And then we have the other part, which is the Agada, which is the the stories of the Jewish people, which also gives you a good idea of, of what, what goes on, the history of the Jewish people. And uh, many of the many of the pieces in the Agada are written in the form of like fables almost. It's like stories, but these stories are very deep and they give us they give us a deeper understanding of life. So a lot of these a lot of these stories are 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 couched. Uh, they're almost like uh, examples. The deeper ideas which we're going to see. And but today's piece of Gemara is also going to help us understand the Gemara itself and how the, the, uh, the oral tradition unfolded. So we are looking now, and Trang, I sent you online. For those that are online, I sent you all copies of this piece of Gemara. This is a piece of Gemara from uh, Baba Metzia. So uh, Baba Metzia, we know that uh, the... Uh, Remember, we studied that there are the six sections of the Mishnah, which is which the Talmud is based on. Uh, the first one is Raim, the agricultural laws, then Moed, the, the laws of, of, of the holidays, and then the time-related laws, and then Noshim, the laws marital law, and then you have uh, the fourth section, which is known as tort law, Nezikin. And Nezikin tort law, the, the most famous tractate of, of tort law are known as the Babas. Uh, the Babas, you remember the Babas, because you all know Yiddish, what's a Baba? A Baba is a grandmother, right? 
So we have Baba Kama, the first grandmother, Baba Mutsia, the middle grandmother, and Baba Basra, the last grandmother. But that doesn't mean grandmothers. Baba means a, a, uh, a gateway. There are three gates to this knowledge. So this is, this is the, these are the primary tractates that discuss tort law. The laws of damages, the laws of partnership, laws of, of, of uh, 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 finding lost objects, uh, baylords and baileys, uh, the laws of, 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 uh, of uh, neighbors uh, having issues with each other, building fences, but good fences make good neighbors. I'm just giving you some of the ideas that are in this tort law, in the laws of Nezikin, but they're called the three bubbles, three bubbles. How did we get the three bubbles, the three gateways, the three gates? And there are three tractates, some of the, some of the longest tractates. And in, in yeshiva, actually, you spend most of your time on these three tractates. They're the most popular tractates in yeshiva because it sharpens the mind. Um, what we're learning today is, is, is Baba Metziah 59, which happens to be a piece of Agadata, a little piece of Agadata story within that tractate of Baba Metziah. But why are they called three three gates? They say that the Bubbis were really one Bubba. <laughs> they were once one tractate, but it was so long that they had to divide into three parts. So they call the first Bubba is Bubba Kama, first one. Bubba Metsiya is the middle one, and Bubba Basra is the last one. Bubba Basra, in fact, is the longest tractate of the whole Talmud. The longest tractate of the Talmud happens to be 176 pages. 176 pages. It's, it's interesting that the longest tractate of the Talmud is 176 pages. The longest uh, Parsha, which is Parsha's Nasa, has 176 verses. And the longest chapter of Tehillim is, is, is a famous, famous, uh, um, famous uh, chapter of Tehillim, which is Kufu Tes 119. Chapter 119, and it also has 176 verses. But uh, th that particular uh, uh, chapter of Tehillim, of Psalms, has 176 verses because it goes through all the letters of the alphabet. It starts with Ashrei, Aleph. Every pasuk there is goes to Aleph. There are eight, eight verses of each one of the letters of the name. You know, when someone is sick, usually you read their Hebrew name. In that, in that chapter, you try to read eight verses for every letter of the Hebrew name. So eight times 22 is 176, I believe. So that's how you get 176 verses in Tehillim. But it happens to be also that the longest portion is 176, at the longest tractate, Baba Basra. But we're not reading Baba Basra. We're reading Baba Metzia today. Okay, so we're going to give a little look at the thing you have over here, the handouts. And I'm going to show those that, those that are online. You can look at your, at your pages. Um, or I will now do the famous uh, uh, screen share. You ever heard of that? Yes, yeah, so we're going to do that, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm successful with that, sometimes not. You know, I'm, 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 I've been Zooming for two, three years. I should know it by now, but whatever. But we have our experiences here, so let's see what we can do. Okay, here we go. Okay. Someone will tell me if, they, if you could see it online. Can you see it, guys, online? I'll make it larger, but if you can see it, that's good. Very good. Okay, now, here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to start on the last line. The only reason why I gave you the first page is 59A. 59A, we're going to start with the last the last line of that, uh, of that, of that uh, page, of that block. But let's, let's give a look at, our, at the top of our page. Okay, um, so we're gonna, we're gonna do the little test to see if you guys know what you're doing over here. Okay, so who could tell me uh, what, what track data are we looking at? By looking at the top of the page, what do we see? Huh? Bob, no, Bob but which, what's, the name of the, what's the name of the track data, anyone? Yeah. Bob, Bob Matsia. If there's one thing you'll know by the time you finish this class is how to know where you are on the page, okay? Which page you're at. Okay, uh, what, ch what chapter of Baba Metzia are we learning? No, which chapter? 
Chapter four. Chapter four. How do you know that? So what does it say on top of the page? The fourth chapter. What's the name of the fourth chapter, anyone? Hazahav. Hazahav, right? Hazahav. What does Zahav mean? Goldie. Yeah, gold. Yeah, good. Very good. Yeah, have that. So, so learning that. And what what page are we on? And anyways, on in in the uh, in in this which page? How do you know on page fifty nine? Besides, by looking in the English page, Nuntes. huh? Nuntes, right? Nuntes. We are now on page fifty nine. As we know, Nun is fifty. And Tess is nine, so we're on page 59. What are we on, 59A or 59B right now? We're starting off on 59A. I can see 59A. Okay, so what's, what commentary is on the, on the uh, what, what do we have in the island on the page? What's, what's inside that island? In the island and the page, right in the middle of the page is an island. What's it called? It's Mission Gamar, but what are we learning now? Is this Mishnah or Gemara? Mishnah. No, it's not Mishnah. Wait, what's the you know why? You know how I know it's not Mishnah? Because Mishnah is usually about five, ten lines. You never have a whole page of Mishnah, hardly ever, right? So you could be sure this is Gemara. Okay, we're a smack in the middle of a of a piece of Gemara, right? Okay, what's on the right side of 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 the of the of the of the, of the Gemara? Huh? Rashi. 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 On this this side, it's on the right. So it's always closer to the to the uh, binding, the binding right? yeah, yeah. And what's on what's on the left side of the Gemara? What do we got on the left side of the Gemara? Huh? The it's extreme called, left? Not extreme left, right? Left of oh, left. left. Uh, of what? Opposite Rashi is Toisifah. Toisifah is Rashi's grandson and his yeshiva, Rabbeinu Tam, who is also known as Rabbeinu Yaakov. And uh, and his 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 uh, his academy, okay. So then we have Rashi and Tosfos. Okay, so now we're going to go. We're going to go here to the bottom of the page, the bottom of this page here, and we're going to start trying to read a, a little, to break our teeth in the Hebrew. Uh, at the very last line you see over there, it says, "Tnan Hasam." We learned there. Okay, so now he's quoting. He's quoting a Mishnah from somewhere else, right? And this is going to be the Gemara is going to talk about this Mishnah. So when it says Tnan, Hassam, we learned there, it's not just we learned there, but Tnan is a Mishnah. It's like in, in Aramaic, Masnison is, is Mishnah. Tnan, Hassam, we learned there. So this seems to be sort of a, you'll see this piece that we're reading now, it seems to be kind of a re irrelevant kind of uh, subject. But maybe we'll connect it later to what we're trying to bring out. Uh, because there's a piece of Agadita that follows this that's very important, a piece of Agadita that's going to tell us a, great secrets of the oral tradition about Mishnah and Gemara. We're going to learn a lot today about the power of the, of, 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 of the rabbis, the power of, of, the, of the Gemara, and, and, and it's the interrelationship of Gemara, Mishnah, and, and God himself. What's the connection? So let's read the, the, the Mishnah in the Bible. So it says, Tanan Hassan, we learned there. So the Gemara, the Gemara, the members of the Gemara, remember the Gemara was in around the year four or 500 uh, after the common era. And the people of the Gemara are, 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 are recording. Tanan Hassan, we learned in a, in a Mishnah. Mishnah where? This is a Mishnah somewhere in Mesechet uh, Kalim. It, it, it's, it's somewhere about, it, it talks about vessels. And remember the last of the six orders, they talk about purity and impurity, right? So if a, if a dead body, Touches a person, you have to go to the mikveh. In the olden days, you weren't you weren't able to 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 come in contact with other people till you went to the mikveh. If you touch, if you came in contact with, if you touched a dead body, but if you had to go to the mikveh, and if you go to the mikveh, you, you, you wait a day or seven days, it depends on the situation. But then also sometimes, if a dead body touches a, a vessel, so the vessel also can can be a, a recipient of 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 impurities. And if you touch that vessel, you become impure as well. So you have to make sure. That's why they have mikvahs where they used to bring the dishes and everybody would bring dishes to make sure everything was pure. But here you have a situation like this. Tan Hassan, we learned there in the in the in the in the section that speaks about about huh? It's the last line of fifth. Uh, let's see where you got. You're you're on the next page already. Look at the other your other Hebrew page. 
I think you're on the other. You're on. Uh, no, you're on the, you're the right page. You're the right place. Uh, uh, the, the very last line over there. Yeah, let me show you. No, no, so it's the last oh, line, okay. the absolute last line of the Gemara. I'm going to show you with my pointer. Okay, that's the way I'll show you here. So you could see the guys over here on the thing. Let me see if I can find my pointer. I can find the way it goes. Oh, I think I can see it now. Let's see. Oh, okay. You see that over there? Now, awesome. You see where we're going? So you can look on your page. You can see my pointer. Okay, now you know exactly where we're reading. Tanan Hossa, we learned there. What does it mean there? There means not here. <laughs> there means in another place we learned. Not here as opposed to the Mishnah that we're discussing now. It says, Chot Chulius. Okay. Um, so it says, Chot Chulius. Let's say you had, let's say, an, 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 an oven. Okay, in the olden days they had like a big... Uh, oven uh, and let's say let's say they broke it up into pieces the oven it was a vessel right and then they broke the oven so now you don't have a vessel anymore so in order to receive impurity it has to be a vessel so now what they did was they broke the uh, chopped up the oven into pieces and then they replastered it and put the oven back together again the question is, is this considered a vessel now to receive impurities? You say in order to become impure, it has to be a vessel. If it's a flat piece of wood, it doesn't become impure. In order to receive impurities, it has to be a vessel. Okay, so listen to this. So they chopped up this oven. So it was an oven. It was an oven. It was a comic of science, right? So it was an oven. And then they broke the oven into pieces. And then they, 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 uh, they cemented it back together again with, with some with different things. With different, uh, with, 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 with crazy glue or something, whatever they, they put it together with, right? And they put it back together again. So now the question is, is this considered now a vessel? It's a broken vessel that's pasted back together again. Is it considered a vessel regarding the laws of purity and impurity? So, right, of course, we had a big argument between the rabbis. So it says, Okay, so it says like this. They, they, they chopped up the, the, the oven. Then they had the different pieces and they put it together with like a cement. I mean, they put sand between each piece. So now the, the pieces are not touching each other anymore. Right? They're being connected by some adhesive of, 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 of made out of sand. Right? Between each piece, they put some, some sand in between. So the question is, is this now considered a vessel or not? I mean, you could, you, could, you could sort of extrapolate for different things in life also, you know, like sometimes we have, you know, a person, that, a person that's a complete vessel and then they get broken up in life and then you put them back together again. Are they considered <laughs> whole again, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it says there was a great debate and there was an argument. So you see the abbreviation, Reish Aleph. Reish Aleph is Rabbi Eliezer. This is the famous rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer. Where do we know Rabbi Eliezer from? I mean, Rabbi Eliezer was a famous rabbi in the times of the Mishnah. This was Rabbi Eliezer, the son of Hurkanus. He was one of the greatest sages that lived in his time. And in fact, if you learn, if you ever read Pirkei Avot, have anyone ever read Pirkei Avot on this, on this class over here? Yeah? Pirkei Avot, right? So over here you have the Rabbi Eliezer. You see the Reish Aleph, like, Four words before the end of the Gemara, right? You see, Reish Aleph, it's Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer. He was a famous rabbi, if you recall, in Pirkei Avot. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was one of the greatest sages that ever lived. And he had five students. Remember in Pirkei Avot, he had five students. One was Rabbi Eliezer. One was Rabbi Yeshua. And one was... Um, and then two, two others, there were five, five students all, all together. But the ones that are important for us are Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua, because they both come up over here, right? So Rabbi Yechonen's student, it says, it says, what were their qualities? So, so it says Rabbi Yechonen ben Zakkai used to speak about their great qualities, about each one of these students. And the one that there was, Rabbi Lezer, he said he was a cistern that never lost anything. And this was Rabbi Lezer. He was so, such a genius, whatever he ever learned, he always kept in his brain, unlike many of others of us that, 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 that lose things the second we have a class, it goes in one ear and goes out the other, right? Rabbi Yazza was different. He, had, he, he was like a cistern 
he was like he was like actually he was like the oven that never breaks <laughs> right he was unbreakable he had a mind that a genius mind he would absorb everything that he had and he would remember everything so this is Rabbi Yaza Mitar. Rabbi Yaza says this, this vessel is, is it's not considered a vessel. So Mitar means he says it's Tahor. It's Tahor means it's pure. Why is it pure? Because we can't consider this a real vessel because this is just a makeshift thing. And, and the, the impurity doesn't travel from one to the other to the other because it, it's broken up with these with the with the glue, with the sand. So Rabbi Yaza holds Tahor. Mitaher means. He holds that it's pure. The Chachamim and the Chachamim, the Chachamim, the other, all the other sages that were at the table. So they had Rabbi Yezer, he was a genius guy, right? But he says Tahor, Chachamim, all the other sages that were present, they disagreed with him. They said, no, you put, you put the vessel together, it becomes a, get, a, a vessel again. So now, Chachamim Mitamin, you see, Chachamim say Tamei. Lezer says Tahor, Chachamim say Tamei means it's impure. Okay, now let's go to the next page. Okay, we go, we go down. Okay, now you'll see, in, I'm just going to show you this in the English. Okay, uh, you see in the English, the translation, I'm just reading at the bottom of the page, the last bit of the English, at the bottom 59A, last line of the English, if you look uh, on the right-hand column on the bottom of here, you see, we learned elsewhere, I'm just reading the translation. If he cut it into separate tiles, placing sand between each tile, that's why they, 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 they're the ones that do the translation. They do a much better job than I did. Rabbi Leaza declared it clean. You see it? You see it? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Here we go. See, Rabbi, we learned elsewhere, right over here. See, I'm like a very big Rabbi Leaza. Yeah. Well, we learned elsewhere. If you cut it into separate tiles, you see it over there at the bottom? You see it? Okay. If you cut it into separate tiles, place it in the center of the tile, Rabbi Leaza and the sages. They cleared it impure. Okay. Now we're going to the next page. Next page. I, I really did this whole thing here for you just to get the first page. Okay. The main page is the next page. And that's 59B. B. So this case over here that they were discussing, the Zahu, you see that over here, I have a Zahu. You see it on the beginning of 59B. You got it over here? You see it in the Hebrew? Can you guys see it over here on your pages over there? I'm just I'm showing it here very, very big. Vizahu Tanur Shal Achnoi. Yeah. It was a, they, they called this this famous case of Rabbi, El, Rabbi Eliezer, who was the student of of who was he the student of? He was the student of yeah, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, right? Now, I, I just want to tell you, Yochanan ben Zakkai, his Rebbe, he was the fellow who really started the whole uh, academies of learning that led to the Mishnah and the Gemara. Yochanan ben Zakkai was, was, was lived at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple, right? And he was a very, very uh, important rabbi in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, Titus was attacking Jerusalem and destroying it. They were destroying everything they saw. But Yechonim ben Zake went out and he met up with the general Vespasian at the time. And uh, he, he really, uh, Vespasian, uh, Rabbi Yechonim found favor in the eyes of Vespasian. So Vespasian said, what favor can I do for you? I'm coming to destroy Jerusalem. Is there something I can do for you a favor? So he says, yes, please spear us, Yavne. Because that's where we started an academy of learning. And tainly Yavne v'chachameo. Give, give me Yavne and the sages, spear them. That was the, the, the academy of learning of the Jewish people. And, and they say Vespasian gave him, gave him Yavne and he, he, he allowed him to... Uh, and uh, the story goes that uh, Yechonim and Zake said to, to Vespasian, long live the king. And, and uh, Vespasian said, I have to kill you because I'm not the king. Which is two minutes later, somebody walked in the door and said that, that uh, the king had just died and you are now the new emperor of Rome. That's a story. So he was very, very impressed with the rabbi. His, his, his psychic abilities to know that he had already become the, 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 the new emperor. 
And so Vespasian kept his word and he spared the academies of learning of, of the yeshiva. But he destroyed Jerusalem. Destroyed everything besides, yeah. besides for, for what we got here. So some, some of the sages in the Gemara, they say, you know, what, what, what was with Rabbi Yechel ben Zake? The Gemara says, he should have asked for Jerusalem. But the answer, you know, he wasn't going to get Jerusalem. It, was, it wasn't an issue. It wasn't a question that they were already, they already had, had Jerusalem in a, in a grip and, and, and uh, they weren't going to give him. But he, at least he was able to spare the, 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 the Academy of Learning in Yavne. And from Yavne came the whole academies of learning that led to the, to the writing of the Mishnah and the Gemara. And the, the Judaism sort of made a major shift at that point from being a, a sacrifice uh, oriented religion. From being a, a a prayer not prayer oriented but a a, a, a a ritualistic religion to one that was going to be from there on more focused to a large degree on on the study of Torah and that's what kept the Jewish people for thousands of years in the exile was was that was that move of Reich Yechen and Zakkai so his prime student was this Rabbi Eliezer so you have to understand the context of this argument. Now, Yezer was he was he was he took over from Yochanan ben Zakkai. So he was the head of the academy. But the other sages disagreed with him. So you have a situation here where the majority was were arguing against the brightest guy in, 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 the, in the class, right? The brightest guy amongst the Jewish people. Question is, who do you follow? And the Gemara is going to tell us a little bit about that. But he says, This famous case, because it was, it was like a landmark, uh, what do you call it, watershed case. That, that it, it, They gave it a name. They gave a name, this whole story of, of the case about this broken oven. But the case itself was not so important. More important was who was arguing and what happened afterwards. They call it the, uh, the, uh, the oven of the serpent of Achanai. They call it the oven of Achanai. And this is a famous case, actually, this piece of Gemara, it's, it's known as the, the Gemara of Tanr Achanai, the oven of Achanai. Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, so Rav Yehuda said, then the Gemara says, my Achanai, what is an Achanai? What, is, what does it mean, the oven of Achanai? So, so uh, Achanai is, 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 is like, uh, is, is a serpent. So he says, what, what does the serpent have to do with this? Omar Rabbi Yehuda, Omar Shmuel, you see the second line, Rabbi Yehuda said the name of Shmuel. The, the, uh, the, all the other sages put Rabbi Yezer in a stranglehold like a serpent. <laughs> they had him in a hold, right? In a, in a grip. They got him. The Timu, and they all agreed that this, this, that this uh, oven will become impure. Okay, even though Rabbi Eliezer the Great, the sage of the time, said it should be pure, and it's, it, it, it's, it's a broken oven, and you, it, can't, it can't be a, 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 a vessel for impurity. But the rest of the sages, they overpowered him like a serpent, grabs their, 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 their enemy in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a vizlak, whatever you call it, yeah? So that says, so that's what it says. Amr Rabbi Yehuda, Amr Shmuel, Rabbi Yehuda said the name of Shmuel, Sheikhifu Dvarim Ki Achna Zu, they, they, they surrounded him like, like, this, like this serpent, Vitimu, and they paskined, and they said, Tamei, it's Tamei. And now comes the famous Gemara that came in, 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 as a result of this whole story. But he, like I said, it, it's called, it's a famous case. It's like a watershed case that that is known to people and it's it, it, even rabbi wikipedia says that this is the most famous piece of gemara that's quoted in the whole in the whole in the whole internet <laughs> is this piece of gemara because of it has it's a very interesting uh, concept okay so so it's called the the uh, the oven of Achunai, the oven of of the serpent like the who the serpent the sages they 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 strangled the rabbi and they Tana, Tana, we learned. Tana, now the Gemara goes on to say what, what happened. So it says on the third line, you can follow in the English also, there's an English translation on the other side, if you could see over here. You see, uh, you see the English page? 
And, and this was the, uh, I'm just going to show you the English a little bit over here, right? Um, if you want to follow the English on the next page, you know, sometimes you can cheat the English, right? Uh, and this is the Oven Achanai. Why the Oven Achanai said that Rabbi Huda in Samuel's name, it means that they encompassed it with arguments as a snake and proved it unclean. Okay, they, 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 they beat Rabbi Yilazer. So it has been taught. Now we're going to go back to the Hebrew. I'm just showing you the English. So if you want, you have the papers there, you can follow the English also, okay? So now, Bo, I'm, I'm going to do it in the Hebrew just to make you feel uh, very... Uh, in, in the Hebrew with Aramaic, it, so, it sounds uh, much deeper. <laughs> Anyways. In that day, we learned, on that day, on that day when the Seid, they had this famous argument of the, of the oven, the oven argument, the oven of Achunai. So on that day, Heshev Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Ezer answered, "Kol tshuva shabaylam." He responded to everything that they, 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 that the sages asked him. Remember, he was one guy battling a whole table full of a whole room full of other sages. He he disagreed with them, so it says he responded, "Kol tshuva shabaylam." All the respond, all the responses of the world. And but the sages said, "Ah." We're, we're, we're going and saying that this is Tame. We, we're in the majority. And this is a very important thing in, in that how, how this, this is a foundation of Jewish law, that majority rules. That even if the smarter guy is in the minority, and even if he, he brings all the arguments of the world, there are certain rules of how the, the Jewish law works. And that's what we follow. One of them being majority rules. And this Rabbi Eliezer said, okay, I'll prove to you that I'm right. Omolahem, he said to them, now, now once, once they didn't accept the, the arguments on an intellectual basis, he says, okay, I'll show you from a spiritual way that I must be right. I, I, will, I will now perform miracles. Omolahem, he said to them, Imalacha kamaisi. If the law is like me, Kharuv Zayachiyah, he pointed to Kharuv. Kharuv is a, 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 a carob tree. Now, those days, the rabbis up, up in northern Israel, like at Abshim Bayachai, there were a lot of carob trees. You know what a carob tree is? In Yiddish, they call, in Yiddish, they call it boxers. You have fake chocolate they use to make out of carob, right? But in Yiddish, we used to call it boxer. Remember the boxer? Yeah, that's what we used to call it in Yiddish, boxer. Anybody over here remember the word boxer? So boxer, boxer, that's the thing that breaks your teeth. Like when you get my age, you can't eat those things anymore because it breaks your teeth. It's like so hard, right? But they, they have some soft spots on it. So you chew on it and, you, and, and you, it, it's, it's good for teething for kid, little kids, you know, carobs. But those, the, the, those days, that's what, they, that's what they survived on. They had carob trees and, 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 and brooks of running water in Northern Israel. And so, so Rabbi Leza said to them, to all the rabbis, I will prove it to you with this carob tree that I'm right. So suddenly, boom, neke charuvim koimai, the, 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 the carob tree got plucked out of its roots and it jumped out, meya ama, 100 cubits, it's 150 feet, a whole, uh, a whole football field, right? The, the carob tree just flew out and it ended up 150 feet Oh, wait, 100 cubits. Cubit is on. This is like, I, I, I tell you, the stories, the Gemara, they're a little bit like sort of, uh, they almost sound like fables, but listen to the, listen to the context, right? The Amrela and other people say, so it seems like this was a real thing because some rabbi said he, they, he moved it 150 feet. The Amrela Arbame, Arbame is Amma. Some say 400 cubits. He moved this carob tree, 400 cubits, that's 500 feet. How much? How much is a is, is a football field? Mm -hmm. Like a hundred yards, maybe? Huh? Hundred yards? That's like three hundred feet. Okay, so this is five hundred feet. It's like two two fields. Okay. 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 So, so he thought he really got the sages now. Like, oh, everybody's looking at you. <laughs> They're sitting, sitting. I guess they must have been studying outside, right? And they see suddenly he plucked out the tree and the tree went flying on its own, like mystically, 
to the other side of, 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 the, of the field. So they said to him, You can't bring any, any, any halachic right proofs from a tree. <laughs> you're a mystic. You can do tricks. You're great. Yashikoyach. Bravo. You were able to move the tree. We're very impressed. But in this academy, we're going according to the majority. And you could do whatever you want. We can't bring proofs. Uh, a, a carob tree is not a proof. He says, okay. Then he goes on to tell them. I'm, I'm reading one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines from the top. He said, he returned and he said to them now, okay, if the halacha is like me, I'll prove the halacha is like me. The law, halacha means the law, the law is like me. You see over here, a stream of water. A stream of water will prove that I'm right. He did like Moses. The whole stream of water started going backwards. It was going, the stream was going in one direction. And suddenly it started going backwards. Like Moses, he was able to 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 uh, to make the stream go backwards. He wanted to prove that the heavens and everyone agreed to him that this is the right thing. And they believe all this, huh? They believe it. Who they they, they, they saw this. Okay. No, this is real story. This is a story. Okay. I mean, whether whether it's it's some deeper thing or not, we can talk about that later. But but right now the story seems to be it's like a real story. He did. He started performing miracles, basically. And he said, in the merit of the miracles, follow what I have to say. And Allah they say, sorry, you might be a good miracle maker, but but we're not we're not we're not changing the law because of your ability to to uh, to change the direction of this stream of water. So, so they answered back to him, Amrullah, they said to him, Ain Mavin Raya, we don't bring proof from a stream of water. Okay, so he saw he wasn't getting anywhere with the sages. He tried, he, he plucked out the tree, threw it 300, 500 feet, didn't work. He, the, like, like Moses, he went and he, he changed the direction of the water. They didn't, they didn't listen to him. Okay, he said, what I'm going to do is, if the halacha is like me, the walls of the best medish, the walls of the yeshiva, Will prove it to me. So the uh, the 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 walls of the of the base medish started to fall. Mm. Okay, he's like a powerful guy. This guy, right? Rabbi Eliezer, <laughs> it started to fall. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there you. So Rabbi Yeshua, remember one of the other students of, 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 of Rabbi Yechon Mazaki, the second student, whose name was Rabbi Yeshua. So Rabbi Yeshua was the next, the next most important guy in that in that room over there. So he started to scream at him, Rabbi Yeshua. And God Bahem, who did he scream at? He didn't scream at at, at, uh, at the Rabbi Eliezer. He screamed that he was, he was shot, he started to shatter the walls. And he tells the walls, you can't mix in, guys, <laughs> right? Stop falling, because they all it was about the wall was about to collapse on, on the whole yeshiva. So he says, "Stop! You can't mix into this." He tells the walls. So the walls stopped collapsing. And what happened was, so the wall like ended up somewhere in the middle, and it froze at that point in the middle. So Rabbi Yezer was making it fall, and Rabbi Yeshua told the walls, "Don't mix in." So it stopped in the middle. And as the Gemara says. That the, the wall of that base of Medrash is crooked till this very day. Because if you go on the, on the tours of, 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 of Israel, you, there's a place that they say that this is the wall of the base Medrash. <laughs> yes. There's on, on one of the tours. Go, 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 the tours. You go look for the, ask for the when next time you go on a tour, find out where this wall of this wall of Rabbi Yezir is. Okay, go ahead, Ben So Rabbi Yezus starts screaming at that and says, I'm going to prove that I am right in the halacha. And the walls start to fall. Comes, uh, comes Rabbi Yeshua and shouts at the wall, stop, don't interfere in our, in our halachic debate. The, you, you're, you're important walls, but don't mix in. 
Amalehem, he said to the walls, in if the rabbis are arguing in halacha, what's your what's your uh, nature? Like what are, we, what are you mixing in? So it says, Loi Noflu. You guys able to follow it in the Hebrew? So it says, Loi Noflu, it didn't fall because of the respect for Rabbi Yeshua. But Loi Zakfu, but it didn't straighten out again because of the honor of Rabbi Eliezer. So the rabbis were arguing, so the wall sort of stood in the middle on an, on an angle. And he says, the Gemara says, Vadayin, Matim, Vaimdim. Until this very day, they still are standing in that in that crooked position. And now this 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 argument gets really really exciting. Uh, we're going to talk shortly, and you'll tell me what you what do you think they're trying to say over here? What's the point, right? Because of Amalehem, he said to them, "Im halacha k'may that Rabbi Yehuda said, if the halacha is like me, min hashemayim yechichu. If the halacha is like me, let the heavens prove it." And suddenly there was thunder and there was lightning. And Yotzer Sabaskel, a voice came out from heaven. But Amra and said, Huh? Batkol, yeah, Batkol, yeah, the, the female one. But Amra and the Batkol said, This voice from heaven said, This mystery voice, Malachem Eitzer Rabbi Eliezer. What do you guys have anything to do with Rabbi Eliezer? Shalach Kamaisi Bechol Makim. The Allah is always like him. He always gets it right. He always has the Allah like him. So in heaven, a voice from heaven came and said, the halacha is like Rabbi Yezer. Omer Rabbi Yeshua, Omer Rabbi Yeshua Raglan. Rabbi Yeshua stood up from on his feet. I guess that's an expression. He stood up. The Omer and he said, guys, let's not get impressed by, by, by uh, uh, trees flying, by rivers, rivers changing, by even by voices coming from heaven. Guys, we got to be strong. But Omar, he said the verse from the Torah, it says, Lo the Torah is not in the heavens. The Torah was given to us on earth. We have to judge the Torah based on our understanding on earth. So the heavens can't mix into our arguments here. Yeah. You got it over there? You see where it says? It's not in the heavens. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna read it for you quickly in the English over here, on the English side, so you get a little feel for it. On that day, Rabbi Leza brought brought forward every imaginable argument, but they did not accept them. Said he to them, "If Allah had recently let this carrot tree prove it, thereupon the carrot tree was torn a hundred cubits out of its place. Others are from four hundred cubits. No proof can be brought from a carrot tree." They retorted. Again, he said to them, if Allah agrees with me, let the stream of water prove it. Whereupon the stream of water flowed backwards. No proof can be brought from the stream of water, they rejoined. Again, he argued, if Allah agrees with me, I'm just, just translating what I just said. Let the wall of the schoolhouse prove it. Whereupon the walls inclined to fall. But the Rabbi Yeshua rebuked them, saying, when scholars are engaged in Allah disputes, what have you to interfere? What right do you have to interfere? Hence, they did not fall. In honor of Rabbi Yeshua, they didn't fall in honor of Rabbi Yeshua because he, he said stop. Nor did they resume the upright in honor of Rabbi Leza, And they are still standing thus inclined till this day. Right? Again, he said to them, if the Allah had reason, they let it be proved from heaven. Whereupon a heavenly voice cried out, why do you dispute with Rabbi Leza, seeing that all matters Allah agrees with him? But Rabbi Yeshua rose and exclaimed, it is not in heaven. What does he mean by this? What does he mean by this? I'm reading it now further in the English, which I didn't read yet in the Hebrew. Said Rabbi Jeremiah, Rabbi Yermia said that the Torah had already been given in Mount Sinai. We pay no attention to a heavenly voice because the Tao has long since written the Torah at Mount Sinai after the majority one must incline. So it's an interesting thing that the heaven said that from after the Torah was given, that from now on, if you have a, a question, follow the majority. Don't come back to voices from heaven. Don't come back to any miracles. It's like um, it's like it says regarding prophecy, similar thing. 
that if a prophet comes to say that the Torah is not is not applicable anymore, then that prophet is a false prophet. Well, I don't even know he's a false prophet. Maybe he's he's listening to the word of God, a new word of God, right? That came later enough. Because nothing is far Jews, our main revelation from God was a Mount Sinai, where the two million Jews were present, and we heard the word of God ourselves. Everything else that comes thereafter is individual people saying they heard from God. That cannot override what all the Jewish people saw together and heard directly from God at Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai is the most important revelation. And what did Mount Sinai say? Mount Sinai said, if you want to interpret this book that I'm giving you today, don't come back to me. I'm leaving it to you now to interpret it. And majority shall rule. You shall follow the majority. So it's like God put a clause inside his book that almost says that you can't come back to me to resolve your problems. You, even if, and even if God himself, a voice will come from God saying different than what the majority rules, we can't, we don't follow the, the, the voice, the voice, even from the voice from God. We have to follow the, the, the teaching of the Torah, which says you shall follow the majority. And so, yes, there's a voice from God. Obviously, we have to respect the voice from God, but we can't go against what God said at Mount Sinai, which is to follow the majority. Okay. Uh, yeah, very important. That very important. Very important. So many questions. Yeah. Okay. Just one, one second. The, the the story gets even the the plot even thickens even more in the next piece. Rab Nathan met Elijah, Elijah the prophet, and asked him. Rab Nathan was present there, and he bumped into Elijah. I guess Elijah was hanging out with those Elijah the prophet, and asked him. What did the holy, you know, Elijah the prophet is a prophet that's still, uh, he's around. He's, he's an angel, right? He said, Eliyahu Navi comes on Pesach. That, that Eliyahu Navi, right? So he said, that, he asked him, what did the Holy One, blessed be he, do in that hour? At that moment, where the sages said, we are not listening to the voice that's coming from heaven. And we're following majority rule because that's what we were commanded at Sinai. What did God, what was God doing then? <laughs> he just said, he should go according to Rabbi Yazir, and the sages rejected it. So I think God would be angry. So he says, no. Elijah says, he laughed with joy. He replied saying, my sons have defeated me. My sons have defeated me. <laughs> hear this. God himself. God himself said in the heavens. And he laughed. He was happy. It doesn't mean he laughed. He was, it's like a father has nachas. From his kids, sometimes a parent gives over the business to the kids and says, I'm not going to mix in. You have to make it work yourself, right? And then that's, it's your business now. And then the kid is doing something and the father says, no, 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 do something else. <laughs> and the kid says, no, 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 you gave me the keys of the business. You told me to run the business. I'm running it this way. And 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 then the father says, I'm proud of my son. <laughs> I gave him the keys of the business. I told him to run the business. He listens to my advice, but he's doing what I told him to do. So this is what he said. He says, God said, this is a very famous line. Natschuni b'ni, natschuni. Natschuni b'ni. My children have been victorious over my children. They, they beat me in the argument. <laughs> In other words, they they have the they have the override. Okay, but let let's put it this way. Okay, uh, it, it's almost like God. And this this gemara is very interesting because it makes God very vulnerable. God God says like God lost an argument with the rabbis, <laughs> right? Makes God vulnerable, which is a very interesting twist, very interesting Jewish twist that only have in Judaism. You know, where, where Avram Avinu is arguing with Hashem to save Sodom and Gomorrah. And Moshe Rabbeinu is telling Hashem to change his mind. And over here, it's more than that. God get, voices an opinion in, in this particular argument. And and <laughs> and the sages say, no, <laughs> sorry. We gave your opinion. We heard it. 
a majority rule. That's that's the law. That's your law. That's your law, right? You're following your Torah, your law. Rabbi Plotkin, where yes. does it say that one, that the people must follow the decision of the majority rule? From what, what is the root of this law? Okay, the root of that law is Achrei Rabim Lahatot. Achrei Rabim Lahatot. It's in the book of uh, Exodus, Parshat Mishpatim. Parshat Mishpatim. Uh, I don't know the exact verse by heart, but you look in Mash Parshat Mishpatim, somewhere in the middle of the of the of the Chumash. Uh, but I'm sure it says it over here at the bottom. Let's go. Uh, the bottom here, I'll show you where it says it uh, exactly. Uh, two. Uh, the second here, yeah, it springs over here. Exodus. Exodus 23. Two. Okay, it's chapter 23 in Exodus, verse two. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if you look at that footnote over there, it says, though the story is told in a legendary form, this is a remarkable assertion of the independence of human reasoning. Okay, that's what the, okay. Now, now the, uh, which I'm saying, but this is like a powerful piece where Hashem himself says to the Jewish people, to, to the rabbi, he says, you have, you have, you have beaten me. In other words, God being vulnerable. Now let, let me let me speak about this God God's vulnerability, you know, uh, and about can God be wrong? Right? Obviously, God can't be wrong. That's the definition of a God, right? Can God create a rock that He can't lift? <laughs> of course, He can, because He's God. He could do anything. So if he wants to, he can create a rock that he can't lift. God has the ability to do everything. Now, God chose to be vulnerable with us. He tells us in the Torah, please do for me the mitzvahs. I need these mitzvahs. Uh, I think it's God need a mitzvah. No, but in the Torah, he says, I need you to do these things for me. Why? Because I'm entering into a relationship with you, the Jewish people. And by choice, I want to have a relationship with you, almost like a human relationship, where you do things for me and I'll do things for you. And it will be when you will, when you will, uh, uh, you know, do what I, as I tell you, then I'll give you the rain on time. So it's, it's a back and forth. It's a relationship, right? And God, get, God gets angry in the Torah. He decides to destroy the world. And he, they pray for it and he doesn't destroy the world. The whole Judaism is, is about a, a, a God that, that shows signs of vulnerability, yeah. but by, by jealousy and all, but it's not a, you ask the question, God's perfect. Yes, but he, out, out of his perfectness and out of, out of his ability to do everything, he can choose to, to enter into this. So he gave, he gave us the Torah. Let's, let's talk about this case. Forget about all the other cases in Exodus and, and, and Genesis and the Torah. In this particular case here, which is, which is very, very important, is what God did was he gave us a book. And he gave us a Torah. He told us to follow it. And now he says, I want you to be a partner with me. And I've given you the laws. And now I need you to interpret them. Okay, all the interpretations are implicit in it. But God says, now, when you're going to interpret it, and even those, if it's not, might not be the most imperfect interpretation, in fact, I might disagree with the interpretation and say, that's not what I meant. As we see over here, God says, I'm with Rabbi Eliezer. What are you guys? But you're following the Torah. And the way you're figuring out what the law should be is based on the rules that I gave you so then that becomes the will of God, even though God disagrees with it. <laughs> you, feel, you follow what I'm saying? So it, 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 it's very, very convoluted in a way. But what? It, it, how, could, how can we go against God's wish? No, it's not really. If you look deeper, it's not against God's wishes. That's what God wants. God wants us to interpret it in a way that might be weak. But if majority rule, that's God's wishes, then that becomes the law. And that becomes the God. Then that becomes God's wishes.
almost like I said, like a parent that gives over the business to the child and says, here, I'm giving you everything. Now you run it. And I'm not going to intervene. I might give my opinion once in a while. You don't need to follow my opinion on that. But, but as long as you follow the rules of the business, then, then, then you, 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 that will be my will. Yeah, okay. Question. We have a question. Go ahead. I'm a little bit confused by this because mm. Rabbi Krishna wrote a book where you got created the world and then kicked out. And that's a very controversial. Right, right, right. So, so a, a lot of what, a lot of what he's, a lot of what he says might have been based on some of this, right? Okay. But this makes it sound like he gave the Torah. He said, based right, on right, right. But he's still, he's, he's, huh? No, okay, okay. But the, yeah, yeah. This is very, by, by, it's a very good question. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go. Away. I'm going to come back to it. Okay. Did you ask? Yeah. Change from the prophecy, wow. a direct prophecy, and now you have to think for yourself. Right, right. That's what happened. And that's why this was a very important piece. Like I said, this was a change at the destruction of the temple. Until then was the era of prophecy, where God let his wishes be known very, very clearly through the prophets and all, et cetera, et cetera. It was the era of revelation. Now what was going to happen, it was going to be no more the era of revelation, but our connection to God will be through the books of God and through studying it and through interpreting it and understanding it. And in that way, we... We we get to the essence of God. Yeah. So um, but I just want to say that that God gave us certain tools, and those tools is the way that we connect to him. It's not that he, he left us, it's not direct revelation, but he, he he implanted his wishes through our minds. And 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 so it's not it's not prophecy anymore, like you said. It's not God saying this is what you got to do, right? But God impl implanted in our brains the ability to interpret the Torah, and if we follow the the rules of the Torah itself, like like uh, you shall follow the majority rule, then that becomes the will of God, and and, and that becomes that becomes God's word to us today. So yeah. if you take, I mean, if you extrapolate this. You take an instance like Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. There was one decent human being. Right. <laughs> Everybody else, the majority had a decent idea. Right. Um, majority rule would have been a very dangerous thing there. Right. But majority rule, okay, let's let just make it very clear. The majority rule doesn't mean that you have to follow the fashion of, of Paris and of Hollywood and 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 if, if if all people are are doing sodomite uh, practices, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a majority of, of of people who are following the word of God as as outlined in the Torah, and they say this is the law. You know, we're not we're not talking about people that are, that are, that are you know we're not talking about societies where everybody decides to kill everybody and societies where everybody is is corrupt. That's that's uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the times of the of the of Noah's flood, right? We're talking here about about people who are entrenched in 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 in, in Torah study and and they are pious, honest, uh, following the, the the laws, and they sit down and they seriously try to understand the text, and then uh, you know seventy percent believe this way, thirty percent follow the seventy percent, and that's like I said last time, that's that's the whole basis of the code of Jewish law as we know it today, was a consensus amongst the Jewish people in the understanding and the interpretation of the law. And that's how that's how the code, the code of Jewish law was was uh, was finalized. Okay, let's read a little bit more of the Gemara. Okay. Just let me see. Let me see some faces here over here. What's going on? All right, give me a second here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little more. I mean, look, this Gemara definitely gives you a lot of things to think about, right? It's it's, but it's a it's a it's it's quite a famous piece of Gemara. Give me a sign is no longer valid. Huh? Give me a. Sign. I mean, you could have signs, and you could have things, and you could have inspirations, but not law is not created by signs. So, in other words, you could have a, a great Rebbe who could do miracles and all of that. But if but if he is out, you know, outnumbered and outruled, 
You know, this was this was the way it worked with it. They used to have they had Shammai and Hillel. The halacha is always like Hillel, not like Shammai. Even though Shammai was, Shammai guys were much sharper. You say there was a it was, it was a sharper yeshiva, but Hillel had the numbers, and Achir Rab Lhatas, you follow the majority rule. So that's why most of what we do today is according to the rulings of, of Hillel, because they had more they had more numbers, and that's that's what that's what it is. Um, Nice to see everybody. I just wanted to check out everyone's faces over here. And uh, are you guys, guys online, you're able to hear? Are you able to follow what we're saying? Mm -hmm. Zev, Zev, you're good. I'm good, yeah. The Thank only you. the only thing that I would say is like when you try to follow the hero, he, not hero, the Hebrew, and when you scroll down, like the eyes play tricks, you lose the line. Can you like keep the pointer? Pointer, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah. We'll try to do it. You know, my, my, Rebbe, my, Rebbe, my Rebbe Yeshiva used to say, yeah. halt the finger off the pointer. The, the, the Yiddish used to say, yeah. you know, point, the, point me the finger, point me the finger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was the abuse we used to take in Yeshiva. You know? Put your finger in the place. <laughs> but now you know why they were they were so adamant to put your finger in the place because you were dealing with these 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 pages of the Talmud that if you don't keep your finger in the place you have to start from the beginning again. Yeah. Okay, I'm 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 uh, going back to the to can read a little bit more. I'm going to read. Yeah, uh, Susan, you raised hey your hand. Yes, I just have a really quick question. The Thanks. really the really big words like the words that are written in the really big letters is does that mean they are sig really significant and what would those words be on the pages right, right. so so the, 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 if you if you saw there was like an island in the middle with the biggest words right that's that's the gemara that is the that is the talmud itself right the other smaller words on the right side the left side that's the commentary on the gemara Right. No, I meant there were just like a couple of really big words, like the font was really big on those. There was a, um, what, there, was a there was a kuf, a chet, yud, yud, kuf, and then there was also a vav. Oh. Yeah, okay, okay, so that's okay. So this one, you're looking, you're looking right now, the, the main thing you have to look at is the middle. The, the, the island in the middle of words. The, okay. That on the right side, on the right side that you were looking at, that's tosva. Tosvot is 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 is, um, is 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 a commentary, right? And the Tosvot starts with these big words. You know, each one of these is 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 a, is a whole paragraph for itself, and it starts with a big word. That was just the choice of the of the printer, kind oh, of to, okay. to bring your attention to that to that. In other words, they they they, they quote the, the Tosvot takes like three or four words from the Gemara, and then and then it it, it gives you its commentary. So this okay, is the so these are the first words of the paragraph quoting the Gemara. So if you're learning the Gemara and you're learning, let's say, uh, that's quoting from the Gemara. So the Gatoisvis has something to say about it. So so the Taisvis says, is the word me, and he smiled. Actually, that's the one you picked out. That's very nice. You picked out that one. Oh <laughs> means God smiled. Right, and he said, "My children have beaten me. My children have beaten me." Right, God smiled. So Taisva says, "It says, it says somewhere that God doesn't smile since the temple was destroyed." So that's what Taisva asks. What does it mean that God, God smiled? So it says, it doesn't mean he smiled. He was he was constantly happy. He just he liked the joke. It was just a funny thing that moment and smiled. But then he went back to his serious self. Okay, so that's that's what the Taisva Taisva chooses. Well, what does it mean, God laughing? We know that God doesn't laugh. It says after the structure of the temple, it says no. He doesn't laugh on a permanent basis, but once in a while he gets a kick out of things, right? So you got a kick out of the, these these rabbis here that they, they wouldn't listen to him. So it's Thank a real you. nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very anyway, much. That's that place. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the page. What's what's going on with you over there? You have like a discotheque. What's what was that? Uh, huh? Trying to FaceTime me, Ah, okay, okay. So let's go back to the share screen. What what time we got? Okay, we're good. We're still good. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. Hmm. I lost the page. How do you like that? Okay, we got to go back to there. Okay, we're there. 
Uh, okay, I'm going back to my. Uh, so, how do you read out the difference between corruption uh, back in the temple versus the real sages and their majority? Yeah, how do you know when it's a real, real, real uh, majority or or a corrupt majority? You know, obviously, that could be a, a tricky thing. I mean, it's, it's, there are other, there are other rules besides majority rule as well, right? But uh, major, majority rule we're talking about it has to be a a, a, a majority of, of 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 judges, a majority of people that have smicha, a majority of people that are, are are learned and are pious and are are observant and you know. Um, so sort of to, yeah, yeah. So, the, so, so there, there was, there was, there was a time. Yeah, yeah. Be... Okay, okay. But, but there, there could be even. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that soon. But let's try to read a little bit inside first. Okay. Hmm. Uh, there should be. Oh, there probably is another page of translation which I don't have here. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, but I see 59B has two pages of translation, which I don't. Okay, well, let's continue a little bit from the translation that we have here, and I will use the pointer momentarily. Okay, so we see uh, Nasa met Leo and asked him, What did the Holy Mom bless me see doing now? He laughed with joy, he replied, My son, to the fever. Sorry. It was said on that day. So the, the, the sages really dug their heels in, right? On this on this majority rule uh, principle. And like I said, till this very day, that seems to be the guiding light of Jewish law, of halacha. This is like the most important halachic principle. And that's what, uh, uh, you know, what, what till this day, the code of, the code of Jewish law, the minority opinions, the majority opinions, and we follow the majority opinions. Hmm? On that day, all objects which Rabbi Yazir had declared clean were brought and burnt in fire. <laughs> they were really uh, angry over here, right? So Rabbi, Rabbi Yazir wouldn't give up. He he continued to keep his opinion, right? Remember, this is, was called the, the oven of Chachanoi, right? So he he said, no, 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 this is pure and 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 we can use it. But the sages said, no, it's impure, right? So what did they do uh, that day? When they heard God said, my sons have defeated me, my sons have defeated me, God, so to speak, agreed with this principle that you don't listen to any of the tricks of Rabbi Eliezer and you don't follow any of his miracles and you don't follow any of, even the voice of God you don't follow to in this case. So they, they were vindicated and they took all the objects because Rabbi Eliezer, which he said was clean, and they brought them burnt into the fire. They then took a vote and excommunicated him. You know, in the olden days, that was a serious thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but they excommunicating him because he wouldn't follow the majority rule. Right? So they excommunicated him. It's called the chayrim, right? Like yeah. a, they can't huh? for them. Right, right. You have to stay away from the person, etc. Said they, who shall go and inform him? Who's going to go tell Rabbi Yelazar, such a big guy? They were all afraid of him because he could do, he could, he'll pull a few trees out and it'll, 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 you know, who knows what he could do. He could, he could turn you into a, into a mountain of bones. You know? <laughs> so who shall go and inform him? So I will go answer the Rabbi Akiva. Lest an unsuitable person go and inform him and thus destroy the whole world. Right? So like they, they were all afraid of him. <laughs> he could destroy everything, right? So, so I'm going to go and tell him, look, because this was the halacha. The halacha was if you don't follow what, what the majority rule is and, and you don't follow what the Torah says, so you're excommunicated. What did Rabbi Akiva do? He donned black garments, wrapped himself in black, and sat a distance of four cubits from him. That's that's what you're supposed to do when somebody is in excommunication. Akiva said Rabbi Yazid to him, what has particularly happened today? Yeah, well, what are you dressed in black garments? And he understood good and well what was going on, Rabbi Yazid, right? So he says, Master, he knew how to say it, Rabbi Akiva to him. He replied, it appears to me that thy companions Hold aloof from thee. They're staying away from you. So he didn't say you, you, you are you are being put in chayrim. He says your 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 uh, peers are staying away from you. 
So thereupon, he too rent his garments, put off his shoes, removed his seat, and sat on the earth, while tears streamed from his eyes. He realized what had happened with Rabbi Eliezer. He was very, very, he was mortally hurt by it. But he followed what was, what was being done. Yeah. Um, so he says, what happened was, the world was then smitten. <laughs> They wouldn't believe the back calls. Yeah. And they wouldn't believe the miracle. Right. But they would believe Elijah, who is dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, telling them yeah, yeah, what but, God said. Okay, but let, let's put it, let's put it this way. It, it's, it's a good question, but they didn't base it on the words of Elijah. They based it on what they knew was right from the Torah. They happened to have words from God that agreed with them to the fact that they rejected the word of God. But, but, but that was not their basis. The basis was three words in the Bible. Akhre, Rab, and Mahatis. He followed the majority, majority rule. That's what they based it on. They, did, they didn't base it on it. They were happy to hear that, that the same voice that's shouted out, you guys are wrong, said, they, my children have beaten my children. Both of those are not enough to make any decision. If they just would have heard the voice of God regarding this, it would have been just as, as poor as, 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 as Rabbi Liaz's proofs, right? But what, what was their proof? The proof was the halach. Now, they were, they were happy that the voice from heaven, uh, you know, uh, proved that as well. And the voice of heaven agreed to them, but that, that was not their basis. Okay. Now, it's a pity that I don't have any more of the, of the English, so I'm going to go back to the Hebrew, and I'm going to read it to you from the Hebrew. So if you go back to the Hebrew page, because there's another page of translation, which I did not translate. So it says what happened was after that, Rabbi Eliezer was hurt. He was mortal, mortal, more, mortally wounded. You know, like he was, uh, yeah. So it says, um, the world was smitten. Shlish Bezaisim, everything, all the produce in the world started to become less. One third of the of the olives uh, were, were were smitten. Shlish bechitin, one third of all the all the grain. Ushlish besoirim, one third of all all the all the barley. And the beer business went down. Everything. Also the 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 even the the uh, the uh, dough of the challah all shriveled up. Because of of, of Rabbi Yezer's, uh, because he was he was hurt. And later the Gemara says that how careful we have to be with words. Also, when we even though you know even though they were uh, uh, right, the rabbis, but you have to be sensitive to to someone else's feelings. Yeah. Panna, we learned that day there was, there was a great tragedy on that day. Whatever Rabbi Leza looked at, it, it got consumed by flames. Yeah. Even Rabbi Gamliel, who was the head of the of the of the academy at the time, he was in he was in a he was in a uh, ship. A big wave came to drown him. Omer. I imagine it must have been because of Rabbi Yazir. They almost, he almost drowned. He stood on his feet. This is Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel, who was the head of the, the, the Jewish community at the time, and he knew about the story of the, of the, of the, of the oven, Tanu Shalachanoi. And, and he, he was about to drown. He turned to God and said, Hashem, it should be known before. We did not do this for our honor. And it wasn't for the honor of our family because it's our opinion. All that we did, that the sages, we did for your, for your sake, God. That there shouldn't be arguments in Israel and that there should be a way to resolve the disputes in the way that you want it. So it says, the, world, the, 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 the ocean calmed down from its storm. And it goes on to say, I'll tell a whole bunch, a whole bunch of other stories, but I thought this, this is this is important that that the principle that that when we follow majority rule, the minority has to know 
that it's not that the minority is 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 no good. It's 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 just that's the word the word of God. You have to follow what 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 the Torah says. And 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 uh, and this is this is a very very important principle of of the whole Torah that that when 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 sages come to a certain conclusion and you have a court case or whatever it might be and you have different opinions and then you come to a final opinion you're not you're not criticizing the minority and and we're not we're not criticizing uh, we're not and it doesn't even have to be that that is that is it, it's not necessarily a perfection it could be something that's a little bit imperfect too but that is the law and when it, once it becomes the law that becomes perfection as we're going to learn another Gemara about this next week, along the same line, to continue along the same lines of this, this whole this whole concept, of, and, and this is sort of the basis of of, of the the halachic process. That, that's that's quoted over. Yeah. So again, to extrapolate. Yeah, say louder so the people on the thing. Yeah, the modern day, this expression, the modern day rabbi, yeah, yeah, yeah. making new. Extrapolation, right, right, on their own, right. Whether it's the broccoli or the whatever, right, right. So, or so, that. so it needs that is, there's no majority going on there. There's no there is there is group there, of there is. sages. There is the, 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 all, all that is that is being uh, uh, taught is is being extrapolating on the on the principle of majority of opinions. So they will follow. They will follow the majority of of, of, of the and broccoli is uh, not a very good example. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's sort of become fashionable. The rennets, the broccoli, the all these sort of things. Where for time immemorial, cheese was cheese until they, you know, and all of a sudden you had someone come up with the idea that there's a hormone in the bowels of an animal, that, and therefore it's from the bowels of an animal and. It, it's almost what, like whatever, what, what, whatever, 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 whatever is, is 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 brought up is subject to scrutiny, and subject to disagreement, right. and, and then and then it, then it's followed by 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 discussion and consensus building, and that's the way the halachic process works. It works based on, on consensus building. Now, so can a, now, a group now, like Leib Tahor come to a consensus? You know. Um, Left to heart is a minority. Where they would of, of, say that all their they're, they're, agree. they're a minority of a minority. They, they, I'm talking about a, a consensus amongst the Jewish people, not the consensus amongst a few quacks. You know what I mean? Like uh, you know, the, 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 there's a there's a you know we're not, we're not talking about in the uh, in the uh, you can get you can get a, a consensus of in the, in the seventh floor of the Mount Sinai Hospital. I don't know what the, the floor is over there where they have people that, that think that they're Moses and, uh, <laughs> and think that they're, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, whatever, right? We're not talking about that. That's not a consensus. Uh, you know. if, if a group of people come together and it's a cult, that's, uh, we're not talking about cults. We're talking about uh, the, the Jewish people and, 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 and the, 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 like, look, look, there are opinions. And some people follow opinions, but eventually the discussion starts and people come back and forth and back and forth. And then there, and then there is a halachic consensus based on, on a majority of the opinions of the Code of Jewish Law. Yeah, look, obviously there's always going to be disagreements and there are disagreements. And so, but there's a process. That's all. We're talking about now the process. You know what I mean? The, some people could say in this case, like you have a lot of, a lot of like opinions, let's say they come to face. You have some, let's say, reform rabbis, right? But they they say, well, we hold today that they, we, we're maybe the majority of the Jewish people, right? Change, right, yeah. right. But reform doesn't doesn't respect halacha, so you can't you can't turn to halachic process and say, <laughs> you know, if you don't if you don't respect halacha, you can't say because the majority rule in halacha, you, you have to you have to be you have to buy into the system. This is the system over here that we're talking about, right? And mm -hmm. if you buy into it, and a majority of the people you know, hold whatever it is, then then it's then it's uh, then, it, then it follows that. Okay, we're going to stop now because it's it's a uh, and and the mitzvah shem next next week is the last class of the six week course. Doesn't mean we're not going to have more courses afterwards. 
But the six-week course before the winter break is going to be Mitzvah Shem uh, this next week. next week. And we'll tell you what our plans are for the future next week. So stay tuned. The next week is an important class. It's the finale for this for this course. And we're going to learn another piece of Gemara in Masech de Menachos that, that sort of continues on the same theme of the of the development of the oral tradition and development of halacha. Okay, any any more questions? Anyone online have questions? Anyone here? Anyone live has questions here? I still have any question. Yeah, who's got a question? Anyone? No questions. Eliza, you're good. Eliza, nice to see you. Okay, everyone's good. Paul, you're good. Brian, good. Richard, in concealment over there. Zev, you good, Zev? Okay, okay, very good. Okay, guys. Thank we'll see you. Thank you, Thank you Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.